1857. The city of Delhi was the rallying point of India's first war of independence. It was the beginning, the birth of an Indian consciousness, Indian nationalism. For all the brute force and cruelty of imperial might, a flame was lit in that year that within less than a hundred years brought about the complete disintegration of the largest empire the world has ever known. The emperor of Hindustan, Bahadur Shah Zafar, was humiliated, exiled, and his two sons murdered in cold blood. All of India was humiliated. But there were those who did not lose faith. Those who, like the Rani of Jhansi, who fought to the death with splendid courage. Nineteen twenty-eight, Lahore. The courage and the spirit were more alive than ever. The will to freedom defied the cruelest of police repression. A nation's long imprisoned soul was manifesting itself in the courage of ordinary men and women, the courage of millions of citizens. Among them was one who was savagely beaten, a son of the soil and a leader of men. One whose whole adult life was a defiant laughing challenge to the might of the British Empire. A policeman's stick battered him to death but even as the flames consumed his body, the people of India knew that this man had helped to set fire to the edifice of empire. His name, Lajpatrai. Dhudike is a small village in Punjab, no different to thousands of others. Here on January the 28th, 1865, Eight years after India's first war of independence was born Lajpatrai. His parents did not even dream that he would one day be called the Lion of Punjab. His parents were poor. Lajpatrai's mother was illiterate but a woman of character, deeply religious and utterly devoted to her family. Lala Radhakishan his father was a village schoolmaster. This diary records the date on which his son was born. Lajpatrai was a precocious child who worked hard at his books and did very well at school. But his father hadn't the means to send him to university. As a young lad of 15, he came to Lahore, where he joined the well-known government college for law. He secured a diploma which enabled him to practice in the junior courts. A few years later, he passed his pleadership examination. This permitted him to start practice in the district courts of Hisar. Not long after, in the early 90s of the last century, he appeared before the Lahore High Court. As an advocate, he was immediately successful. The young Lajpatrai had even then a forceful personality and a mastery of Hindustani which made him an eloquent and persuasive orator. Lahore in those days was passing through a social and religious ferment generated by two movements, the Arya Samaj and the Brahmo Samaj. Lajpatrai was greatly attracted by the Arya Samaj which stood for reformed religion and for nationalism. He joined the Arya Samaj in 1882 when he was 17 and as he often repeated later, never regretted it. His earnings as a lawyer were considerable but when the time came to choose between legal practice and public service, he abandoned the law. This combination of public service and the political life was chosen also by some of his contemporaries, notably Tilak, Annie Besant, and Dada Bhai Nauroji. Lajpat Rai was a voracious reader and something of a scholar. He wrote the biographies of Mazzini and Garibaldi. 
of Lord Krishna, Shivaji, and Swami Dayanand. Swami Dayanand died on Diwali day in 1883. With his two friends, Lala Hansraj and Pandit Guru Dutt, also disciples of the Swami, Lajpat Rai decided to raise a memorial to their Guru. And there came into being the first Dayanand Anglo-Vedic College at Lahore. Up to the age of 40, Lalaji, as Lajpat Rai came to be known, devoted his time to constructive work. He helped to establish the Punjab National Bank in 1895, a bank which today has branches all over India. In 1897, he went to the aid of the thousands who suffered in the Rajputana famine. Starvation and death moved him to intensify his efforts in the cause of the common man. In 1904, he organized relief work after the Kangra earthquake. During this period, he helped to found an English bi-weekly paper, the Punjabi, which first appeared in 1904 and was always noted for its fearless writing. Until 1905, Lalaji had kept aloof from active politics. The partition of Bengal in 1905 stirred him deeply and marked his return to the Congress sessions, which he had stopped attending for some years. He plunged into active politics and with Bal Gangadhar Tilak and Bipin Chandrapal, he was soon recognized as a national leader of daring and boldness. The trinity was known as Lal, Bal, Pal. At the Congress session of 1905, the radical Lalaji broke with Gopal Krishna Gokhale, who headed the moderate group. He did not believe in begging for freedom. He called upon his countrymen to be more assertive and self-respecting. At the Calcutta session of the Congress, presided over by Dada Bhai Nauroji, Lalaji supported the famous fourfold resolution on Swaraj, Swadeshi, boycott of British goods and national education. In Punjab, political unrest was growing. The British government's colonization bill stirred the people of Lyalpur, Montgomery and Multan, mainly soldiers and ex-soldiers of the Indian Army. Lalaji headed the campaign against cooperation with the British. His co-leader was Ajit Singh, uncle of Bhagat Singh, the personification of great revolutionaries. The lion of Punjab had begun to roar. The villagers of Punjab were awakening to the cause of freedom. Riots broke out in Lahore, Rawalpindi, and other places in Punjab. It was a fateful year, 1907, the 50th anniversary of the First War of Independence. The British Raj, panicking, resorted to the deporting of Indian leaders without trial. Lajpat Rai and Ajit Singh were deported to Burma and detained in the Mandalay Fort. Lalaji spent much of his time reading and began work on his autobiography, never to be completed. As a result of an outcry in India and in England against arbitrary deportation without trial, the two revolutionaries were released. For the next six years, until the eve of the First World War, Lalaji was engaged in social service. Schools and colleges were open for boys and girls, hospitals, orphanages, and widows' homes were established. The campaign against the caste system was intensified. Lalaji fought for equal rights for the so-called untouchables. In the eyes of God, all men are equal. It should be so in the eyes of man, too. The 
Morley Minto reforms, giving India a small measure of self-government, were announced in 1909. 1911, Delhi Darbar. When princes loyal to the British Raj and toadies of the commercial class paid homage to the King Emperor. London, 1913. The Congress sent a deputation consisting of Lalaji, Bhupendranath Basu, and Muhammad Ali Jinnah to put the Indian case for independence to the British public and the government. While the deputation was in England, the First World War broke out. Lalaji was of the opinion that Indians should extend all possible help to the British, but he made this cooperation conditional on the complete Indianization of the Indian Army. Knowing he would be arrested on his return, Lalaji decided to stay in exile until the war was over and the situation in India more settled. The next six years were spent abroad, mostly in the United States. He established valuable contacts with many American intellectuals who helped him to organize lecture tours on India. He wrote articles to radical journals such as the New York Times and the New Republic and published a number of books of which the most important was Young India, a book dealing with the early history of the national movement. Lalaji also established the India Home Rule League in New York. Lalaji then went to Japan where he met Indian revolutionaries, Rash Bihari Bose and M. N. Roy. In India, at the end of the war, the Montague Chelmsford reforms grudgingly allowed another small dose of self-government. At the same time, the infamous Rollat bills provided for summary trial without right of appeal for political acts. They decreed imprisonment for the mere possession of any document considered seditious. In Punjab, popular demonstrations against the British Raj were mercilessly put down, culminating in the massacre at Jallianwala Bagh. General Dyer issued the orders that led to the firing of 1,605 rounds on his own admission until my ammunition was almost exhausted and this on an unarmed crowd, a majority of them peaceful farmers. The official British estimate was 379 persons killed and 1,200 wounded. And after this orgy of bloodshed, General Dyer quietly went to bed in his pink striped pyjamas. The entire nation was shocked by the atrocities. Even so, the people persevered in their non-violence. popular uprising, the Raj declared martial law in Punjab. It was a hard time, a cruel time for the people of India. Lalaji returned to India in 1920. The country was seething with indignation and revolt. Indo-British relations deteriorated to a point never reached since the rebellion of 1857. It was time for political action.
The little boy from the village of Durike had come a long way. The Lion of Punjab was elected president of the Congress. session of the Congress in Calcutta that Gandhiji moved his memorable resolution on non-cooperation. Foremost among the Mahatma supporters were Lalaji, Motilal Nehru, C.R. Das and Maulana Azad. The non-cooperation movement emphasized the importance of Indian goods. Spinning became the symbol of the non-violent fight for freedom. Motilal Nehru and Lalaji, among many others, led the movement for the boycott of imported British goods. The Sikhs, the martial people of India, used to generations of fighting. Even they had such faith in Gandhiji that they restrained themselves and followed the path of non-violence despite provocation and cruelty. suddenly suspended by Gandhiji in 1922 after an outbreak of mob violence against a police party at Chauri Chora. Lalaji was agitated by this order to retreat. He did not fully share Gandhiji's belief in non-violence. One result of this setback was the formation of the Swaraj party by Motilal Nehru and C.R. Das. Lalaji supported their move. By this time, Lalaji had founded the Servants of the People Society to serve the nation in various fields, educational, social and economic. Among the members of the society were Lal Bahadur Shastri, Pashatam Das Tandon and Balvantrai Mehta. The appointment of the All-British Simon Commission in 1928 angered Lalaji. It was incredible that Indians should have no voice in determining their own future. He led the movement for the boycott of the Simon Commission in Punjab. On October the 29th, 1928, Lalaji led a procession of protest against the Commission to the Lahore railway station. The demonstrators carrying banners and shouting slogans were peaceful. Guarding the approaches to the railway station was a large contingent of policemen, headed by a British officer who, without any provocation, pounced on Lalaji and rained a torrent of baton blows on him, many of them on his chest. That very evening, injured though he was, he ignored the advice of his doctors and addressed a mammoth public meeting. Every blow hurled at us today he declared, will be a nail in the coffin of the British Empire. This indomitable man paid the supreme price for his bravery. He died of his injuries 18 days later, on November the 17th, 1928, mourned by the nation he had loved and served so well. The Lion of Punjab was no more. But as Mahatma Gandhi said, Lala Lajpat Rai is dead. Long live Lalaji. <laughs>